on social media. And of course, you can share us with a friend. This episode is dedicated to the listener who wrote a review requesting an episode by author Elizabeth Gaskell and by Brilliant Colors. Tonight, we'll read the opening to the social novel North and South, published in 1854 and written by Elizabeth Gaskell. The novel's protagonist, Margaret Hale is forced to leave her home in the tranquil, rural South to settle with her parents in Milton, a fictional industrial town in the North. Elizabeth Gaskell, often referred to as Mrs. Gaskell, was an English novelist, biographer, and short story writer. Her novels offer a detailed portrait of the lives of the many strata of Victorian society. Her work is of interest to social historians as well as readers of literature. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. Chapter 1. Haste to the Wedding Edith, said Margaret gently, Edith. But as Margaret half suspected, Edith had fallen asleep. She lay curled up on the sofa in the back drawing room in Harley Street, looking very lovely in her white muslin and blue ribbons. If Titania had ever been dressed in white muslin and blue ribbons, and had fallen asleep on a crimson damask sofa in a back drawing room, Edith might have been taken for her. Margaret was struck afresh by her cousin's beauty. They had grown up together from childhood, and all along Edith had been remarked upon by everyone, except Margaret, for her prettiness but Margaret had never thought about it until the last few days, when the prospect of soon losing her companion seemed to give force to every sweet quality and charm which Edith possessed. They had been talking about wedding dresses and wedding ceremonies and Captain Lennox and what he had told Edith about her future life, where his regiment was stationed, and the difficulty of keeping a piano in good tune, a difficulty which Edith seemed to consider as one of the most formidable that could befall her in her married life, and what gowns she should want in the visits to Scotland which would immediately succeed her marriage. But the whispered tone had latterly become more drowsy, and Margaret 
after a pause of a few minutes, found, as she fancied, that in spite of the buzz in the next room, Edith had rolled herself up into a soft ball of muslin and ribbon and silken curls and gone off into a peaceful little after-dinner nap. Margaret had been on the point of telling her cousin of some of the plans and visions which she entertained as to her future life in the country parsonage, where her father and mother lived, and where her bright holidays had always been passed. Though for the last ten years, her Aunt Shaw's house had been considered as her home. But in default of a listener, she had to brood over the change in her life silently as heretofore. It was a happy brooding, although tinged with regret at being separated for an indefinite time from her gentle aunt and dear cousin. As she thought of the delight of filling the important post of only daughter in Hellstone Parsonage, pieces of the conversation out of the next room came upon her ears. Her Aunt Shaw was talking to the five or six ladies who had been dining there and whose husbands were still in the dining room. They were the familiar acquaintances of the house, neighbors whom Mrs. Shaw called friends, because she happened to dine with them more frequently than with any other people, and because if she or Edith wanted anything from them, or they from her, they did not scruple to make a call at each other's houses before luncheon. These ladies and their husbands were invited in their capacity of friends to eat a farewell dinner in honor of Edith's approaching marriage. Edith had rather objected to this arrangement, for Captain Lennox was expected to arrive by a late train this very evening but, although she was a spoiled child, she was too careless and idle to have a very strong will of her own, and gave way when she found that her mother had absolutely ordered those extra delicacies of the season, which are always supposed to be efficacious against immoderate grief at farewell dinners. She contented herself by leaning back in her chair, merely playing with the food on her plate and looking grave and absent, while all around her were enjoying the mots of Mr. Gray, the gentleman who always took the bottom of the table at Mrs. Shaw's dinner parties, and asked Edith to give them some music in the drawing room. Mr. Gray was particularly agreeable over this farewell dinner, and the gentlemen stayed downstairs longer than usual. It was very well they did, to judge from the fragments of conversation which Margaret overheard. I suffered too much myself, not that I was not extremely happy with the poor dear general but still, disparity of age is a drawback, one that I was resolved Edith should not have to encounter. Of course, without any maternal partiality, I foresaw that the dear child was likely to marry early. Indeed, I had often said that I was sure she would be married before she was nineteen. I had quite prophetic feeling when Captain Lennox. And here, 
the voice dropped into a whisper. But Margaret could easily supply the blank. The course of true love in Edith's case had run remarkably smooth. Mrs. Shaw had given way to the presentiment, as she expressed it, and had rather urged on the marriage, although it was below the expectations which many of Edith's acquaintances had formed for her, a young and pretty heiress. But Mrs. Shaw said that her only child should marry for love, and sighed emphatically, as if love had not been her motive for marrying the general. Mrs. Shaw enjoyed the romance of the present engagement rather more than her daughter. Not but that Edith was very thoroughly and properly in love. Still, she would certainly have preferred a good house in Belgravia to all the picturesqueness of the life which Captain Lennox described. The very parts which made Margaret glow as she listened, Edith pretended to shiver and shudder at, partly for the pleasure she had in being coaxed out of her dislike by her fond lover and partly because anything of a gypsy or makeshift life was really distasteful to her. Yet, had anyone come with a fine house, and a fine estate, and a fine title to boot, Edith would still have clung to Captain Lennox while the temptation lasted. When it was over, it is possible she might have had little qualms of ill-concealed regret that Captain Lennox could not have united in his person everything that was desirable. In this she was but her mother's child, who, after deliberately marrying General Shaw with no warmer feeling than respect for his character and establishment, was constantly, though quietly, bemoaning her hard lot in being united to one whom she could not love. I have spared no expense in her trousseau, were the next words Margaret heard. She has all the beautiful Indian shawls and scarfs the general gave me, but which I shall never wear again. She's a lucky girl, replied another voice, which Margaret knew to be that of Mrs. Gibson, a lady who was taking a double interest in the conversation from the fact of one of her daughters having been married within the last few weeks. Helen had set her heart upon an Indian shawl, but really, when I found what an extravagant price was asked, I was obliged to refuse her. She will be quite envious when she hears of Edith having Indian shawls. What kind are they? Delhi? With the lovely little borders? Margaret heard her aunt's voice again, but this time it was as if she had raised herself up from her half-recumbent position and were looking into the more dimly lighted back drawing room. Edith, Edith, cried she, and then she sank as if wearied by the exertion. Margaret stepped forward. Edith is asleep, Aunt Shaw. Is it anything I can do? All the ladies said, Poor child, 
on receiving this distressing intelligence about Edith, and the minute lapdog in Mrs. Shaw's arms began to bark, as if excited by the burst of pity. Hush, Tiny, you naughty little girl. You will waken your mistress. It was only to ask Edith if she would tell Newton to bring down her shawls. Perhaps you would go, Margaret, dear. Margaret went up into the old nursery at the very top of the house, where Newton was busy getting up some laces which were required for the wedding. While Newton went, not without a muttered grumbling, to undo the shawls, which had already been exhibited four or five times that day, Margaret looked round upon the nursery, the first room in that house with which she had become familiar nine years ago, when she was brought, all untamed from the forest, to share the home, the play, and the lessons of her cousin Edith. She remembered the dark, dim look of the London nursery, presided over by an austere and ceremonious nurse, who was terribly particular about clean hands and torn frocks. She recollected the first tea up there, separate from her father and aunt, who were dining somewhere down below, an infinite depth of stairs, for unless she were up in the sky, the child thought, they must be deep down in the bowels of the earth. At home, before she came to live in Harley Street, her mother's dressing room had been her nursery, and as they kept early hours in the country parsonage, Margaret had always had her meals with her father and mother. Oh, well did the tall, stately girl of eighteen remember the tears shed with such wild passion of grief by the little girl of nine, as she hid her face under the bedclothes in that first night and how she was bidden not to cry by the nurse because it would disturb Miss Edith, and how she had cried as bitterly, but more quietly, till her newly seen, grand, pretty aunt had come softly upstairs with Mr. Hale to show him his little sleeping daughter. Then the little Margaret had hushed her sobs and tried to lie quiet as if asleep for fear of making her father unhappy by her grief, which she dared not express before her aunt, and which she rather thought it was wrong to feel at all after the long hoping and planning and contriving they had gone through at home before her wardrobe could be arranged to suit her grander circumstances and before Papa could leave his parish to come up to London, even for a few days. Now she had got to love the old nursery, though it was but a dismantled place and she looked all around with a kind of cat-like regret at the idea of leaving it forever in three days. Ah, Newton, said she, I think we shall all be sorry to leave this dear old room. Indeed, miss, I shan't for one. My eyes are not so good as they were, and the light here is so bad I can't see to mend laces except just at the window where there's always a shocking draft, enough to give one one's death of cold. 
Well, I dare say you will have both good light and plenty of warmth at Naples. You must keep as much of your darning as you can till then. Thank you, Newton. I can take them down. You're busy. So Margaret went down, laden with shawls, and snuffing up their spicy eastern smell. Her aunt asked her to stand as a sort of lay figure on which to display them, as Edith was still asleep. No one thought about it, but Margaret's tall, finely made figure in the black silk dress which she was wearing as mourning for some distant relative of her father's, set off the long, beautiful folds of the gorgeous shawls that would have half smothered Edith. Margaret stood right under the chandelier, quite silent and passive, while her aunt adjusted the draperies. Occasionally, as she was turned round, she caught a glimpse of herself in the mirror over the chimney piece and smiled at her own appearance there. The familiar features in the usual garb of a princess. She touched the shawls gently as they hung around her and took a pleasure in their soft feel and their brilliant colors and rather liked to be dressed in such splendor, enjoying it much as a child would do with a quiet, pleased smile on her lips just then, the door opened, and Mr. Henry Lennox was suddenly announced. Some of the ladies started back, as if half ashamed of their feminine interest in dress. Mrs. Shaw held out her hand to the newcomer. Margaret stood perfectly still, thinking she might yet be wanted as a sort of block for the shawls. But looking at Mr. Lennox, with his bright, amused face, as if sure of his sympathy in her sense of the ludicrousness at being thus surprised. Her aunt was so much absorbed in asking Mr. Henry Lennox who had not been able to come to dinner, all sorts of questions about his brother, the bridegroom, his sister, the bridesmaid, coming with the captain from Scotland for the occasion, and various other members of the Lennox family that Margaret saw she was no more wanted as shawl-bearer and devoted herself to the amusement of the other visitors, whom her aunt had for the moment forgotten. Almost immediately, Edith came in from the back drawing room, winking and blinking her eyes in the stronger light, shaking back her slightly ruffled curls and altogether looking like the sleeping beauty just startled from her dreams. Even in her slumber, she had instinctively felt that a Lennox was worth rousing herself for, and she had a multitude of questions to ask about dear Janet, the future unseen sister-in-law for whom she professed so much affection, that if Margaret had not been very proud, she might have almost felt jealous of the mushroom rival. As Margaret sank rather more into the background on her aunt's joining the conversation, she saw Henry Lennox directing his look towards a vacant seat near her, 
and she knew perfectly well that as soon as Edith released him from her questioning, he would take possession of that chair. She had not been quite sure from her aunt's rather confused account of his engagements whether he would come that night. It was almost a surprise to see him, and now she was sure of a pleasant evening. He liked and disliked pretty nearly the same things that she did. Margaret's face was lightened up into an honest, open brightness. By and by, he came. She received him with a smile which had not a tinge of shyness or self-consciousness in it. Well, I suppose you are all in the depth of business. Ladies' business, I mean. Very different to my business, which is the real true law business. Playing with shawls is very different work to drawing up settlements. Ah, uh, I knew how you would be amused to find us all so occupied in admiring finery. But really, Indian shawls are very perfect things of their kind. I have no doubt they are. Their prices are very perfect, too. Nothing wanting. The gentlemen came dropping in one by one, and the buzz and noise deepened in tone. Edith saw Captain Lennox hesitating whether to come in. She threw down the music she was playing and rushed out of the room, leaving Margaret standing confused and blushing to explain to the astonished guests what vision had shown itself to cause Edith's sudden flight? Captain Lennox had come earlier than expected. Or was it really so late? They looked at their watches, were duly shocked at the time, and took their leave. Then Edith came back glowing with pleasure, half shyly, half proudly, leading in her tall, handsome captain. His brother shook hands with him, and Mrs. Shaw welcomed him in her gentle, kindly way, which had always something plaintive in it, arising from the long habit of considering herself a victim of an uncongenial marriage. Now that, the general being gone, she had every good of life with as few drawbacks as possible. She had been rather perplexed to find an anxiety, if not a sorrow. She had, however, of late, settled upon her own health as a source of apprehension, she decided she needed a winter in Italy. Mrs. Shaw had as strong wishes as most people, but she never liked to do anything from the open and acknowledged motive of her own goodwill and pleasure. She preferred being compelled to gratify herself by some other person's command or desire. She really did persuade herself that she was submitting to some hard external necessity, and thus she was able to moan and complain in her soft manner. All the time, she was in reality doing just what she liked. It was in this way she began to speak of her own journey to Captain Lennox, 
who was scented, as in duty-bound, to all his future mother-in-law said, while his eyes sought Edith, who was busying herself in rearranging the tea table and ordering up all sorts of good things in spite of his assurances that he had dined within the last two hours. Mr. Henry Lennox stood leaning against the chimney piece, amused with the family scene. He was close by his handsome brother. He was the plain one in a singularly good-looking family. But his face was intelligent, keen, and mobile. And now and then Margaret wondered what it was that he could be thinking about while he kept silence, but was evidently observing with an interest that was slightly sarcastic all that Edith and she were doing. Edith was in a humor to enjoy showing her lover how well she could behave as a soldier's wife. She found out that the water in the urn was cold and ordered up the great kitchen tea kettle, the only consequence of which was that when she met it at the door and tried to carry it in, it was too heavy for her, and she came in pouting with a black mark on her muslin gown and a little round white hand indented by the handle which she took to show to Captain Lennox, just like a hurt child. And of course, the remedy was the same in both cases. After this evening, all was bustle till the wedding was over.